you, Dr. Sana, um, and thank you, Dr. Shridhar and Marifa Management for giving me this opportunity. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, good evening, everybody, particularly those who are in UNE. Um, I have no nothing relevant to financial relationship to disclose. Um, so over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an overview of non-invasive ventilation, particularly talking about what is non-invasive ventilation, why we talk about non-invasive ventilation and various types or modes of NIV. Uh, I will also briefly touch base on the mechanism and physiology around NIV and um, we will talk a little bit about some um, really important uh, articles that's published around the non-invasive ventilation, which led to change in our practice. And I will conclude my presentation with some practical recommendations. So when we talk about the ventilation, broadly speaking, it is divided into invasive and non-invasive ventilation. And as the name itself suggests, the invasive ventilation is when you are giving ventilatory support through an endotracheal tube. Um, so before we go into non-invasive ventilation, it is also important to understand why we talk so much about uh, non-invasive ventilation, i.e. Uh, more in favor of invasive ventilation or wh what's wrong with the invasive ventilation. So as I, I mentioned, the invasive ventilation means the patient is intubated, which itself is an unpleasant procedure. The intubation itself can be associated with various complications to name a few traumatic intubation leading to air leaks, sometimes esophageal intubation leading to GI perforations and subclotic stenosis, ventilator associated pneumonia, sepsis, ventilator induced lung injury, chronic lung disease, and obviously high mortality. The intubation also depends on the operator's skills. And this is a study which was published not long ago about the success rates of the operators. As you can see on the screen, those who are less experienced um, will have only 24% success rate on the first attempt as compared to the consultant will have 64% success rate on the first attempts. So clearly intubation is an unpleasant procedure associated with complications and depends on the operator's experience. And therefore, we talk a lot about the NIV in neonatology particularly. The concept, concept of non-invasive ventilation is not so new in neonatology. The picture on your screen on the left um, is um, a, a iron lung, which um, used a lot in pediatric practice particularly, where the patient have poor respiratory drive. And the one on your right is a study which was um, done in um, Toronto nearly 50 years ago, where they used this device, as you can see, face mask, which is covering almost entire face of the baby. And they randomized 44 infants between 32 to 34 weeks gestation, comparing intubation versus face mask. And the result of this study, which was published in archive in 1970, showed lower mortality and uh, lower intubation in the face mask group. So coming back to the non-invasive ventilation, the various modes of the NIV, um, we um, classify into constant airway pressure modes or variable airway pressure modes. Among the constant airway pressure modes, you will have CPAP, uh, which you can deliver um, through various ways. And you can also have a nasal cannula, includes high, high flow and the low flow nasal cannula. And the important thing in this nasal cannula device is that although the airway pressure is constant, but it is neither measured nor monitored. Among the variable airway pressure, you have um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which could be synchronized. Then you have BiPAP, which is biphasic positive air pressure or CYPAP. Then two newer uh, non-invasive modes are NIRNAVA and nasal high frequency ventilation. So we'll talk about individual modes separately. I have put down um, nasal CPAP, BiPAP, CYPAP, NIPPV and synchronized NIPPV all together because they're all very similar. The common things in all these modes are uh, CPAP, 
And then on the top of the CPAP, you are giving additional policy pressures. So for nasal CPAP, you need a gas source to deliver the oxygen or air. You need a device to deliver the pressure. You need a hum humidification system and you need a nasal interface. In the BiPAP or CYPAP, which for which you need a bespoke device, the BiPAP is bi-level positive airway pressure and CYPAP is synchronized or side breath above the positive airway pressure. Essentially, both BiPAP and CYPAP are two levels of CPAP where the pressure is only modest. Usually in the BiPAP or CYPAP, you can give pressures maximum seven to eight centimeters above the PEEP. In both these devices, you need higher flow rates and the longer eye time as compared to an IPPV. This is um, about the nasal uh, IPP, IPPV or NIPPV, where you need a gas source, you need a pressure control system, which is usually a ventilator device. Again, you need a humidification system as well as the nasal interface like the CPAP. The interfaces, uh, for most of the NIV devices, uh, NIV modes, you need a nasal interface, which could be a long nasopharyngeal tube, which is not used very commonly. The common interfaces which are used are short binasal prongs, uh, nasal mask, and the nasal cannula. The face mask, which covers mouth and nose, is a, a routine device that we use at the time of resuscitation. But for long-term ventilation, it is not practically possible because it is very difficult to secure properly on the face. So how does nasal CPAP work? Well, when you are blowing the oxygen or air through the nose, it splints the upper airway open, and therefore it reduces the obstruction and the air apnea. It also prevents the alveolar collapse, leading to maintenance of the functional residual capacity and therefore reduces ventilation perfusion mismatch, conserves surfactant and reduces work of breathing. The nasal IPPV also works exactly in the same way as the CPAP, but in addition to that, because you're giving additional positive pressures over and above the CPAP, it helps in better lung expansion uh, by assisting the alveolar recruitment and improving the respiratory drive. This is a pressure curve um, just to uh, illustrate uh, what I just said in the previous few slides. Um, in the, on the left half of your uh, screen, you will see under the heading of A, the patient who is on CPAP or BiPAP, where there is a spontaneous breathing um, at the level of CPAP, which is five, and the uh, BiPAP, uh, which is around 10 centimeters of water. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see the NIPPV where the breath, the respiratory excursions are much higher than the uh, BiPAP. And that's the key difference. And this is the reason some of the trials, which we can discuss later on um, around the BiPAP, fail to demonstrate any benefit. Um, this is a tracing from a baby who. Um, who is a 25 weeker and on your screen you will see um, the graph uh, which is showing the abdominal movements in red color and the chest wall movement in the green color. On the left side the patient is on nasal CPAP and on the right side the patient is on non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation and you can see the thoracoabdominal syn asynchrony which was more obvious in the nasal CPAP converts into more synchronized breathing when the patient is put on the NIPPV. So what are the indications for non-invasive ventilation in general? Um, really right uh, across the board, uh, you can start um, pretty much straight after birth, which is what straight after birth, uh, which is what we do in our unit. Um, it is used for respiratory distress syndrome. It is used for post extubation support and it's also used for the apnea of prematurity. What about the contraindications? Um, usually in those situations where you cannot apply the interface properly on the face. So things like um, conditions like coronal atresia or a large cleft lip and palate. 
If the patient is having persistent and frequent apnea while on the non-invasive support, then it's not a good idea to continue. Similarly, if a patient has a recent upper GI surgery or a baby is requiring high concentrations of oxygen. Complications. Uh, the most important complications of uh, non-invasive uh, modes so far is uh, trauma. And this is usually because of device is not fitted properly or, or not monitored properly um, when the de device is applied for, uh, for um, continuous period of days. Um, because of poorly fitting device, you can also have a leak around the device. Um, in some studies, um, the high rates of pneumothorax and very rarely the pneumoperitoneum has also been reported, but it is usually also associated with um, associated comorbidities. So next um, non-invasive ventilation mode is high flow nasal cannula for which you need a gas source, uh, a device to deliver the oxygen or air, a humidification system and the nasal interface. How does um, high flow nasal cannula work? Um, nobody really actually knows how the high flow nasal cannula work, but what the expert thinks that uh, the flow of, the, of oxygen and air, it reduces the anatomical dead space. Um, because of the flow, the airway pressure is generated, it reduces the inspiratory effort and the work of breathing. Uh, it also provides positive and respiratory pressure and obviously you are giving humidified oxygen, uh, which promotes the airway hydration. I'm also going to briefly mention about um, two relatively new uh, NIV modes. And one of the mode is called NAVA, which stands for Nearly Adjusted Ventilatory Assist. Uh, this is probably the uh, most promising, most physiological um, respiratory mode. Uh, and hopefully in the next few years, we will hear a lot more about um, this uh, modality. What happens in um, NAVA is the, uh, the electrical activity of the diaphragm is picked up um, through the special electrodes. Um, and that is um, acting as a trigger to generate the, uh, the, the, the pressure from the machine and each breath which is generated by the machine, uh, the mechanical breath are synchronized to begin the size of the breath and also termination with the patient effort. This is a screenshot um, of the NIVNAVA and what um, if you concentrate um, the top wavy line is the airway pressure uh, which is in yellow color. The second wavy line is uh, flow, which is in green color. The third wavy line um, is the volume, which is in blue color. And light green color is the EDI uh, signal or the, um, the, the electrical activity of the diaphragm. If you look at the white dotted vertical line, um, the, this is the beginning of the inspiratory effort from the patient. And uh, if you see the pressure is also starting from the mechanical breath's point of view, is starting pretty much at the same time. And if you look at the red dotted vertical line, as the respiratory effort ends going into expiration, the uh, mechanical breath is also terminated. And you can see here, even though the leak is 88, but the synchronization is really perfect. And that's the beauty of the, uh, of the NAVA. By the way, NAVA can be delivered invasively as well. The device um, is a EDI catheter, which is a special feeding tube, which has got electrodes um, at the end of it, uh, and they pick up the electrical signal of the diaphragm. The, uh, the EDI catheter or the NAVA catheter is inserted exactly like any feeding tube, and the position of the catheter is further refined using the ECG on the screen of the ventilator. If you compare the conventional ventilation with NAVA ventilation, the key difference are highlighted in this table. The patient flow um, is the main trigger in the conventional ventilation. And in the NAVA ventilation, it is the neural, the electrical activity of the diaphragm, which is the main trigger. 
And because of that reason, the important difference between the two, as you can see, um, synchronous, synchronous wise, the only initiation of breath is synchronized in the conventional ventilation, while initiation of the breath, the size of the breath, and the termination of the breath, all three things are synchronized in the Nava ventilation. Another uh, newer uh, non-invasive mode is nasal high frequency ventilation, where high frequency ventilation, which is either oscillation or jet, is administered, administered through nose using a nasopharyngeal tube or more commonly binatal prongs. So far, um, this um, mode of non-invasive ventilation has been used where nasal CPAP or other NIV modes have failed. Uh, most of the studies are rather small and heterogeneous, and we can talk about that a little bit later on. So, um, what is the evidence? Um, I just uh, thought about uh, putting this slide up, um, which was a Cochrane review done in 2003, uh, and just want to remind some uh, younger viewers that in um, before mid-1990s, the, the only device that we had following extubation was the head box. Um, it's not used anymore, probably in um, any, at least in the Western world. Um, so this was the Cochrane Review done in 2003, published in 2003, where um, it shows that nasal CPAP is an effective device in preventing the extubation failure. And from that time onwards, the use of CPAP um, became more and more uh, widespread, and there were a lot more further studies um, started to uh, publish. So one of the important studies which was published in 2008 in New England Journal of Medicine was a coin trial where they um, enrolled over 600 preterm babies uh, between 25 and 28 weeks gestation who, who were randomized to either CPAP or intubation soon after birth. The results of the study shows there was less need for intubation or surfactant in the patient who received CPAP However, there were higher rates of pneumothorax in the CPAP group, but that was probably attributable to the CPAP pressure, which was re relatively high. Um, another study which was um, published a couple of years after the COIN trial was support trial. Um, as you, many of you probably know, this was a trial uh, done uh, to find out what is the right amount of oxygen in the preterm baby. And in parallel to that, they also studied the respiratory support. Um, so they enrolled more than 1300 babies, again, 24 to 27 weeks gestation, very similar gestation babies, randomized to CPAP or intubation and surfactant at birth. The results are very similar to the COIN trial showing the need for intubation and postnatal steroid were less in the babies who were on CPAP and there were less need for invasive ventilation in the CPAP group. So both these trials, uh, which were published uh, late um, to 2010, um, were in support of using CPAP um, pretty much soon after birth. Um, around the same time, people were also thinking about what about adding positive pressure um, breaths on the top of nasal CPAP and the concept of NIPPV uh, was also coming up. And this is the study uh, which was published um, in 2012 by Ramanathan and his team where they enrolled 110 preterm babies, very similar gestation age between NIPV, PPV and nasal CPAP. And the patient who were in NIPPV um, showed that there were fewer extubation failures and uh, babies were requiring a uh, reduced amount of oxygen who were on NIPPV support. Um, around the same time, Vineet Bhandari also showed that if you synchronize NIPPV with the patient's respiratory effort, then you can wash out the CO2 even better as depicted by the dotted line um, which is showing the PCO2 in the patients who were on synchronized NIPPV. This is um, a meta-analysis which was published in 2017 uh, and they were looking 
at what is best um, to prevent the extubation failure in preterm babies. And what this, uh, this meta-analysis reported is that NIPPV, whether it is synchronized or not, as compared to CPAP, is the best modality to extubate the preterm baby with a risk ratio of 0.28 and the number needed to treat only four. Um, this is the um, study which actually um, encouraged us to do the nasal cannula resuscitation in the delivery room. Conventionally, we all use face mask um, to resuscitate a baby in the delivery room. But this is a study which was done in Italy, um, which randomized uh, patients between the mask ventilation or nasal cannula ventilation during the resuscitation in the delivery room. Um, enrolled over 300 babies in each arm. And as you can see, both intubation and chest compressions were significantly less in the patients who were put on nasal cannula oxygen or nasal cannula resuscitation. Um, another important trial um, called HIPSTER trial uh, published about four or five years ago in New England Journal of Medicine and that was comparing the high flow nasal cannula versus CPAP. The study was uh, stopped prematurely because of high treatment failure in the patient who were in the high flow nasal cannula group. And around the same time, the, the literature was also supporting that perhaps the high flow nasal cannula is not a good support, particularly for more preterm baby. One good thing uh, came out from the HIPSTER trial was that the nasal trauma rates is much lower in the babies who are started on high flow nasal cannula. I just want to mention about this um, study, uh, which is um, published, which was published last year from North of England by Alan Fenton um, and his colleagues showing the physiological effects of high flow nasal cannula therapy. Um, the results were a little bit worrying, showing, as you can see, that as the flow through the high flow nasal cannula increases, um, the patients can end up receiving very high PEEP uh, of up to six and seven, particularly when the mouth was closed. So I think um, we are going to see a um, lot more about the high flow nasal cannula therapy in the near future. So what about the NAVA? Um, the NAVA studies um, um, only very few in the newborn babies. Um, uh, the studies so far has shown that the device is effective and safe, or this mode is effective and safe, and uh, it can also lead to significant reduction in the um, FiO2, but I think we need further larger studies. A uh, couple of slides about the evidence um, for nasal high frequency ventilation. Uh, this is a study which was done in Netherlands um, showing that those patients who were failing on the CPAP or other non-invasive modes when they were started on the nasal high frequency ventilation, they were the authors were able to effectively wash out the PCO2s. Um, there was a recent uh, meta-analysis uh, published from China um, looking for non-invasive high-frequency ventilation in terms of uh, need for intubation. And as you can see from this diamond, which is shifted uh, in favor of uh, nasal high-frequency ventilation, uh, which seems to be uh, better as compared to nasal CPAP or biphasic CPAP. So final two slides about what we can learn from this so far. So this is what uh, the literature suggests, supports, and this is pretty much what we do in our unit as well. So if I'm going to attend a uh, delivery of a baby who is uh, around 1000 gram or below that, and uh, I will go in there um, with a RAM cannula or a nasal CPAP device, um, you can start pretty much straight away. The key thing is that you should start the uh, non-invasive support as soon as you can. Um, 
uh, either you start with a nasal CPAP of five to six centimeters of water titrating the FiO2 according to saturation. Uh, and if you think the patient is struggling on the nasal CPAP, uh, then you should switch on to NIPPV uh, as soon as you can. Obviously, uh, those patients or those babies who fail on NIPPV or CPAP should be intubated. Um, for the babies who are bigger than 1000 grams, um, again, the same strategy uh, if I'm in the delivery room, but I think for the bigger baby, more towards 1500 gram or bigger, um, there can be a role of high, frequent, high flow nasal cannula. For post extubation support, um, I will extubate a baby who is less than 1000 gram to NIPPV um, um, with the press pressures of 18 to 20 by six. Um, with slightly bigger babies, probably you can extubate to nasal CPAP. Um, for uh, even bigger babies, more than 1000 gram to 1500 gram, again, in addition to nasal CPAP, and NIPPV, there is a role of um, high flow nasal cannula. Um, one final thing um, I would suggest um, is that uh, whatever um, ventilation mode you use, it is important that you get familiar with that, your team becomes familiar with that. Uh, and there is no point adopting to a new mode or new technology uh, if, if the rest of your team is not um, walking along with you. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Agawal, for this great presentation. The update on the new modes of non-invasive ventilation was really helpful. We'll move now 